is things are about to get very difficult for millions of British families. Glad to say the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, joins us now. Thank you very much for being with us uh, morning, this Sophie. morning. Um, keen, of course, to talk to you um, next, about next week very soon, but I just want to start off with Ukraine. Um, it, it does feel like there's just more relentless updates every day. Today, the mayor of Mariupol saying thousands of residents have been forcibly taken to Russia. I don't know if you know anything about whether that's true, but is there an update you can give us on the latest you're hearing from Ukraine? Well, I think as, like everyone, we're watching these scenes unfold on our TV screens. Uh, it's horrifying to watch and, and we sit here in admiration for the bravery and sacrifice of the Ukrainian people. And I think everyone watching should feel really proud about the efforts that we're playing as a country to support Ukraine at this moment. Obviously, people are opening up their homes, uh, most recently to take in refugees. But we are also a leading country in providing humanitarian assistance to Ukraine, £400 million. We were one of the first countries to provide military assistance to them. And again, we've played a leading role in organising the most severe economic sanctions, something that I and my team have also been working on. Yeah, we we'll definitely and... talk about those economic sanctions. Yeah. But just on the refugee scheme you mentioned, it was last week that Michael Gove sat in that chair and told me that today would be the day we'd start to see the first refugees arriving under that scheme. Do you know how many refugees have entered the country under that scheme? And are you planning on opening up your home or giving a room? So, I, in terms of the numbers, what I know is about 100,000 people, over 100,000 people, I understand, have registered their interests and those checks are going mm. through now and there's checks on both sides, as, as Michael probably explained. Has anyone started to there. come yet, though? I don't know if somebody started to come. In terms of the visas that have been approved, my understanding is about uh, 25,000 have completed their applications. Uh, I think almost 10,000 have been granted already with the exact movements of those people, I don't know. But those numbers are ramping up all the time. They're there's more investment in the processing for all of that. And as I said, it's, uh, it's wonderful that we as a country can, can play a role in lots of different ways. Are you joining the scheme yourself? I, no, I think everyone will be helping in, in the best way that they can. And as I said, I'm full of admiration for those who can do that. You know, my wife and I will be helping in other ways. OK, um, OK, that's fine. And so President Zelensky um, has told Russia today that it's time to talk. How optimistic are you? that we could see a diplomatic solution to the crisis. Um, Liz Truss says he thinks, she thinks it may be a smokescreen for Russia to carry out further atrocities after regrouping. Yes, well, I'd obviously defer to the Foreign Secretary and her judgment on this. It, encouraging that there are some signs of talks happening, that's obviously, that's obviously good, but you'd have to have some degree of scepticism about it, given the track record of these things. I think the most important thing is any, any talk of uh, settlement must be on Ukraine's terms, obviously, uh, and the best thing we can do is just maintain the significant pressure that we are bringing to bear on Putin, uh, but also providing support to the Ukrainians in, in the meantime. That's the best thing that we can do, and as I said, and, and the Ukrainians will take the lead. Another uh, thing that Ukraine is calling for is other countries to effectively act as security guarantee tours for any deal that's signed, because obviously it does feel as if uh, Russia is demanding they not join NATO, for example, so they want security guarantees from other countries to protect them in the future. Is that something the UK would consider? Yeah, I think it's it's probably a bit too early to get into the details of what the shape of any agreement might look like. And again, the Foreign Secretary will be taking the lead on these issues together with obviously the Prime Minister. Um, but I think the right thing now is look, continue to put maximum support on Putin, both economically through the sanctions, diplomatic, and also providing a military and humanitarian aid to Ukraine. You know, that's what we need to do. Uh, they are they are displaying unbelievable bravery and sacrifice at this difficult moment. We need to be standing with them. That's what we're doing. And, and hopefully, you know, Putin will see sense. We, we, you know, we Prime Minister has been very clear. We want to see him fail in this adventure in Ukraine. The world has spoken almost unanimously out against it. Uh, and, and of course, we'd like to see a peaceful settlement. But in the meantime, we need to keep up the pressure. Um, as you say, we have seen this unbelievable sacrifice from Ukraine. Um, I just want to play you a clip of the Prime Minister. Um, I'm sure you know what I'm going to play for you. Um, it's a clip of the Prime Minister at yesterday's Conservative Scribbling Party conference. Let's have a listen to what he had to say. It's the instinct of the people of this country, like the people of Ukraine, to choose freedom every time. When the British people voted for Brexit, in such large numbers, I don't believe it was because they were remotely hostile to, to foreigners. It's because they wanted to be free, to do things differently and for this country to be able to run itself. I'll give you another example. Do you think there are parallels to be drawn between the democratic vote to leave the EU and an illegal invasion of Ukraine where thousands of civilians have died? 
No, I, I don't think those two situations are directly analogous. I mean, clearly, clearly they're not directly analogous, and I, I don't think the Prime Minister was saying that they were directly analogous either. He's not saying they're directly analogous, but what he is saying, the people of this country, like the people of Ukraine, choose freedom every time, and an example he gives is Brexit. I said, I, I, the situations are, are obviously not analogous, right? That one is a democratic referendum in a country where, thankfully, we're able to debate uh, ideas in, in peace and, and in freedom. Ukraine wants to join the EU. And, and, and of course, and that, and that should be their right. And actually, that's part of, that's part of the situation that Putin finds, uh, was well, for him, he doesn't like the idea at all, right? Uh, that idea of expression of freedom. But the, I think I said that they're not directly analogous situations, but I don't believe the Prime Minister was saying that they were either. You wouldn't have used those words, though, would you? I, I don't. I don't think the prime minister did either. He, you know, well, they, are, just, they are not. They are not. We just listened to. Yeah, him. and I don't. I look, people would draw their own conclusions. Exactly what the prime minister said. So, so we're not taking this out of any, out of context at all. Yeah, and people and look, people will make up their own minds. But I, 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 I certainly don't think those two situations are directly analogous, and I don't think he does either. So you agree with the prime minister that the people of this country, like the people of Ukraine, choose freedom every time, such as Brexit. I mean, I, I do think people in this country prize their freedom. Of course, of course they do. And well, there's lots of different ways that they express that, whether it's through elections, through referendums, uh, and other democratic means. But right now, the people in Ukraine are fighting for their freedom. It's pretty crass, isn't it, though, to draw those two things together? I, I think no one can doubt that the Prime Minister has taken a lead globally in standing up to Putin's that's aggression. Not, that's not the question uh, I asked well, you. Well, I, I mean, I, 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 there's, there's nothing crass about that. I mean, he's taken the lead internationally in assembling a coalition of countries to inflict maximum economic pain on Putin, uh, and he has galvanised opinion, and, and I think he deserves enormous credit for that. So I don't think anyone could say that he so is you don't, not... So you don't think uh, that, he, that he's not absolutely focused on making sure we can do everything we can to support the Ukrainians at this time, a fact that's been acknowledged by the Ukrainian leadership, actually. Um, and you heard that when, when, uh, when the President addressed Parliament. Uh, but also, more generally, I think it's acknowledged the UK has played a leading role. The Prime Minister deserves enormous credit for that. But, uh, of course, these two situations are not analogous, and no one is saying that they are. Um, whatever happens with the wall, the world has changed. Do we need to start to look at increasing defence spending? Well, we, we had something called an integrated review a little while ago, which takes a comprehensive look at the threats that are facing our, our country and then sets out a plan to address those. Before you well, actually, actually, well, it mentioned if you leave that review, it, it said that Russia was probably the biggest state threat that the UK faced. So in that sense, you know, credit to our defence and intelligence teams who have the prescience to recognise that. And that's why... We already have increased defence spending significantly. But just on that, you no, have, no, no, you have is, increased it significantly. Well, hang on, look, can I, can I, Sophie, if I could just finish, because this is important. So, just a, you know, a year and a bit ago, at a time we're in the midst of coronavirus, for most departments, we didn't provide long term funding settlements. The one department for whom we made an exception because of the circumstances was the Ministry of Defence. And they received a four year settlement, an extra £24 billion over the four year period. That's the largest catch, uh, cash uplift in MOD funding since the end of the Cold but... War and will ensure that we are not just meeting our NATO 2% target, but will remain one of the leading defence spenders in NATO. Uh, and we did that before. But once you take into account inflation, as the RUSI uh, think tank has said, defence spending is actually going to be falling in real terms in 2023 and 2024. You say that you've met your targets uh, on uh, the percentage-wise, but the 2019 Conservative Manifesto pledged to increase defence budget above inflation every year. And like, you, you're not going to stick to that, no, are you? Well, if, you look, if you look in the autumn at the forecasts that were published with the higher inflation in there, what you see is that defence spending is increasing in real terms over this parliament. It's £24 billion extra, uh, and that was done before all of this, because we knew that we wanted so to invest no in our defence. So no more money for defence spending? I, I think, in general, if you look at what we're doing across public spending, you know, we're spending a lot, and the focus has now got to move on to, and I'm sure we're going to get on to talk about cost of living yeah. and people's taxes. You know, so let, before we get into that conversation, you know, I think probably the last time I was here, we were talking about the amount that the government is spending is going up quite a lot over the course of this parliament, okay. an extra £150 billion, more being spent by government on all sorts of things, so defence, schools, like, hospitals, by the end like of the parliament, to me, no more from the money beginning. For I think what spending. people one is say, OK, we get that you're spending a lot of money across the board. We now want to make sure that all that money, our hard-earned money, is going to be spent really well. And that's my focus so no, now. So no, no more money for defence? Uh, and we, we gave lots more money for defence, okay. £24 billion, okay. pounds, but we did it okay. before everyone else. Um, now, of course, we, we talk about cost of living there. The UK has understandably uh, imposed uh, sanctions on Russia, as others have as well. Can you level with people on what that's going to mean for us here in the United yeah. Kingdom? 
So I know this is the number one thing that people are concerned about and people are working hard, they're, they're struggling with the price of things going up. I get that, I'm spending all my time focused on that and I want people to know and they should be reassured that, look, I, I will stand by them in the same way that I have done over the last couple of years to try and make a difference where I can. But as you said, the actions and the steps we're taking to sanction Russia are not cost-free for us here at home. I, I can't pretend that it's going to be easy, that government can solve every challenge, or that I can completely protect people against some of the, the difficult times ahead. But what I can say is where we can make a difference, of course we will. That's what we've done over the past two years. And most recently you saw that with our announcement to help people with energy bills, £9 billion, £350 pounds of support to people. They'll get £150 pounds of that in April. So look, where we can make a difference, of course we will, but I get that this is difficult. How high is the risk of recession? I think, look, you, you wouldn't expect me to speculate on that. What I would say to people is they should feel confident about the strength of our economy. Okay. We're actually, last year, with the fastest growing economy in the G7. And if you look at where unemployment is, we are now back to the levels of unemployment that we saw before the crisis, so very low levels, okay. record numbers of people on payroll, record numbers of job vacancies. So, look, the, the, the fundamentals of our economy are really good because we've recovered well because of the actions we've taken. But, look, the outlook is uncertain, as you've said, because of what's happening in Ukraine. Um, I want to get a bit of a sense of your sense of spending power priorities. And I understand there is only so much you can tell us uh, ahead of uh, next week. Fuel duty is an area where there's been lots of speculation about. Should people feel that there is action that may be taken there? No, I, and I know it's frustrating for you, for people watching. Obviously, I can't comment on specific things. Uh, but what I would say is... A I understand that. I have a rural constituency. People are incredibly reliant on their cars, and this is one of the biggest bills that people face. So we're watching it go up, right? And we're all seeing that. And when we're filling up our cars, I get that. That's why we've frozen fuel duty already. I announced that in autumn. It's the 11th con you know, consecutive year of fuel duty freezes, and that really helps people. I know that. And of course, fuel duty, energy, these are things that people on lower incomes spend a disproportionate amount of their income on. Um, it, it hits them particularly hard when the bills go up. And things are about to get worse for them as well, of course, because in April, benefits are going up just 3%. Inflation, we expect to be around 8%. Can you at least say that you're going to be targeting for your help that you can give the people who are going to need it the most? Yeah, that's, that's what we have done over the past couple of years. No, I'm, if you, I'm, asking, yeah. I'm asking, I'm trying to throw forward. Yeah, and of course, as you can you know, I always say, judge, judge me by my actions. And over the last couple of years, you'll see, and all the research that's published shows this, that those on the lowest incomes have, have actually seen the, the greatest amount of support so from this government. So there will be action, you think, targeted towards particularly those on low incomes? So actually, if you look at what we've already done, and energy, you mentioned energy, which is a good one. I, 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 I acknowledge you want to talk about your record, but I'm just aware of timing. Well, 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 energy, this and... is something about... This is something that's about to come in, right? Mm -hmm. And there are lots of different ways that you could help people with energy bills, and you're going to have Rachel okay. Reeves on later. So one thing that the Labour Party said is that we should just cut VAT on, on energy. Mm -hmm. That is the opposite of targeted, and it would mean someone like you or me, who probably has a larger-than-average energy bill, would get a larger discount. Well, actually, what we've done is provide we'll £150 to... 80% of British households, four out of five English households, that is obviously going to mean a lot more to someone on low incomes, as you said. It's much more targeted support and it will get there much quickly. So we're doing exactly as you have said. We've um, talked about how difficult things uh, are going to get and that you can only mitigate so much uh, of that. Um, but, of course, this is the time you are choosing to go ahead with tax rises in the form of national insurance. I think it's been... Um, it's pretty fair to say that those are going to be going ahead. If you're not going to scrap it... Should we be, expect to see at least some movement on the thresholds at which people start paying these taxes? I think, you know, take a step back. Why, why are we introducing a, a new health and NHS and care levy? It's because I care deeply about the NHS and I know that the country does as well. We were faced with a situation where millions of people were going to be waiting years to get the treatment they wanted as we recovered from coronavirus. I mean, I don't, and we didn't think a in the form and, of and uh, higher think, taxes. I'll get to that in a second. You know, we didn't think that was acceptable for anybody and we wanted to address it. And the team at the NHS are prepared to work incredibly hard to work through that backlog. I wanted to make sure that they had the funding that they need and deserve in order to, to do that. And that's why we're introducing this levy. People can be reassured every penny of it, unlike all other taxes, every penny of this tax goes straight to the thing they care most about. Thanks to the actions of the health secretary, they can also be reassured that it's going to be really well spent because we're making sure we root out inefficiency and we're reforming things and we're actually announcing more ambitious targets on that today, doubling the NHS efficiency target in partnership with them, which is great news. Um, but yes, Ukraine has come 
along and it's made things more difficult, but it hasn't changed the underlying situation that we've got this monumental backlog that we want to work through. Okay. And this is, although it's a difficult decision, I think it's a fair way to do it, it's a responsible way to do it. I just want to show you uh, the graph, um, the following graph. Now this uh, shows, it's from the IFS, and it shows the UK tax changes under different chancellors. Anything above the line is tax increases, everything below the line is tax reductions, and red is Labour, blue is Conservative. So you can see you here right at the end, uh, Rishi Sunak. So in two years, you've raised taxes the same amount as Gordon Brown did in 10 years. How's that um, desire for a low-tax economy going? I guess what that chart doesn't show is all the other chancellors, which ones them had pandemics to deal with. Right, which one, which one of those had to introduce furlough? Which one of those had borrowing higher than at any level since World War II? That's the bit that's not on that chart. And that bar on the right is a direct reflection of those things, which are, I think anyone would say, pretty exceptional, or hopefully pretty exceptional. And, the, you know, no one, last time we had a pandemic to deal with over a century ago, borrowing had never been that high since World War II. It's the biggest recession we experience as a country uh, ever, or than 350 years. So that's not on that chart either. So you're and hoping as a result, your bar's going to come down? I, I do think it will come down over time, and we started on that. And I point people to my comments at the budget last autumn, where I said, yes, have we had to make some difficult decisions? We have. I believe those are the right decisions. There are responsible decisions for, decisions for the country's economic security going forward. Uh, but those are done now. And my priority is to reduce people's taxes. We started at the budget, and you talked about those on the lowest incomes earlier. The first tax cut we put in place was on people on universal credit. They face quite a high tax rate when they're going back into work. We cut that significantly. It's a £2 billion tax cut for millions of people. It, it will mean a single mother, for example, working full-time on the okay. national living wage will be £1,200 okay. better off. So that was the first tax cut, and my priority over time is to keep cutting people's taxes, get that bar down, um, and, and, and that's that's where we're going to head. Um, just finally, will Boris Johnson lead the Conservatives into the next election? Yes. Thank you very much, Rishi Sunak. Thank you. Chancellor there, uh, talking us through uh, the details uh, that are coming up in his uh, spring uh, statement. Now, we are hoping uh, to speak to the Shadow Chancellor, uh, Rachel Reeves. I'll be honest with you, we don't quite have her yet, uh, but we will bring her uh, to you just as soon as we can to try and find out uh, exactly uh, what Labour's position uh, is. Rishi Sunak was touching on that slightly uh, in the interview. Uh, I believe we may have Rachel Reeves. Um, thank you very much for uh, being with us. We just heard from Rishi Sunak, um, who was saying, I hope you can hear me, Rachel Reeves. Hello there. Uh, there you are. Excellent. Good news. So we just heard from uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, the Chancellor, effectively saying that things are going to get difficult uh, and uh, that he is not going to be able to help or fully mitigate the uh, cost of living uh, crisis. Um, what do you make of what he had to say? Well, Wednesday is an historic moment for the Chancellor, for him to show whether he really understands the challenges that people are facing at the moment. Because as a constituency MP in Leeds West, I've got mums who are saying to me, I'm struggling to put food on the table. I'm now skipping meals so that I can feed my children properly. I've got pensioners saying to me, I'm not turning the heating on even though I need to, because I'm worried about how I'm going to pay the bills. And for those people and millions of others up and down the country, we need more than warm words from the Chancellor. We need the Chancellor to do the things that will relieve that pressure on the cost of living, like a windfall tax on the big profits being made by North Sea oil and gas companies and channel that back into lower prices for everybody else. And as for the increase in national insurance contributions, it's the wrong tax at the wrong time that's going to take even more money out of the purses and wallets of working people. Let's talk about the uh, plaid rise to national insurance. Um, we just heard the Chancellor defending it, effectively saying that he needs to sort out long-term funding for the NHS and social care, and that is specifically what that tax is designed to do. It feels like I'm in some kind of parallel universe where Labour is arguing against a tax rise for the NHS. What's going on? Well, originally, you'll remember, Sophie, that the Chancellor and Prime Minister said that the national insurance contribution rise was to fix the social care problem. But we now know that there's going to be no new money for social care in this Parliament. And then they said it was to reduce NHS waiting times. Uh, but there's no credible plan to do that in this Parliament. And all the while, we know that the government are wasting billions of pounds of taxpayers' money. Just in the last few days, we've heard shocking stories 
that £8.7 billion overspent in PPE procurement, including PPE, that couldn't even be used by the NHS, and now the government are burning it. Taxpayers' money literally Please. going up in flames. So you can't help Just wondering whether this tax rise is to pay for a black hole because of this government's waste and mismanagement. Well, either way, if there is a black hole in the NHS, doesn't it need to be filled for whatever the reason is? In which case, why national insurance? Because the problem with national insurance is that it's a tax on work. It's a tax charged by those people who go out to work every day and those people who employ them. Some of the richest people in our country who earn an income through uh, uh, dealing in stocks and shares or through a portfolio of buy-to-let properties, they won't pay a penny more in tax with a national insurance rise. That's not right. It's not right that ordinary working people should be fitting the bill and we are the only G7 economy that is increasing taxes what, what at other a moment taxes would you when like people to... need every penny. What other taxes would you like to see but, but, increase what I'm then? Mm. Or do you think the tax burden is too high? Yeah. Well, first... First of all, Sophie, I think that this is the wrong tax at the wrong time. And in the middle of a cost of living crisis, we shouldn't be increasing taxes. You know, the Chancellor keeps giving interviews and speeches saying that he's a low tax Chancellor. We'll prove it on Wednesday. Reverse this national insurance contributions rise and cut VAT on domestic gas and electricity bills to help people with the cost of living crisis. Now, look, I know that Chancellors have to make difficult decisions. You've got to account for every penny of taxpayers' money spent. But if you are going to increase taxes, you should should ask people with the broadest shoulders to make a uh, bigger contribution. This Chancellor is not doing this with the national insurance uh, increase rise, and that's why I say it's the wrong tax at the wrong time. Do you think Rishi Sunak should cut fuel duty? Sorry, I didn't hear that question, Sophie. Should Rishi Sunak cut fuel duty? If the Chancellor reduces fuel duty this week, we won't stand in his way, but e even a 5p reduction in fuel duty will only reduce filling up the car with petrol by £2. So I don't think that really rises to the scale of the challenge that we face at the moment, which is why we're calling for a windfall tax on the big profits being made by North Sea oil and gas companies right now and channel that in with both a reduction in VAT from 5% to zero on gas and electricity bills, but also a big expansion in the warm homes discount because we know it is families and pensioners on low and modest incomes who are struggling most at the moment with the rising prices. Uh, so that would be my priority. But any sensible measures to deal with the cost of living crisis, uh, of course, Labour would support those on Wednesday. I just want to talk a bit about the windfall tax because this is something that Labour is talking about a lot. You clearly feel that there's a public polling to back you up. But isn't there a real risk that this could discourage investment in the North Sea at a time when, frankly, we do need to focus on our own domestic energy supply uh, because we're trying to cut ties with places like uh, Russia and, independence, uh, and our dependence on uh, places like Russia for oil and gas? Well, when Shell and BP an announced their record profits earlier this year, at the same time they announced a, a big increase in the dividend payments and also share buyback schemes. They didn't I'm announce big future new investment, investment programs. I'm talking about future investment. But this is the point. Mm, but this is exactly the point, Sophie. With the big profits they're making at the moment, they're not channeling that into new investment. Instead, they are using that money to further push up their share prices. And we've also seen big bonuses for the executives at these uh, companies. So it's not clear to me uh, that these profits are being channeled into investment, but instead into further inflating the share price. When I first said that there should be a windfall tax back in January, we thought it would raise about. 1.2 billion pounds. But since then, oil and gas prices have increased substantially, and that uh, surcharge, that windfall tax, would now bring in about 3.7 billion pounds. And the Chancellor says that money somehow is untouchable, but the fact is, Chancellors have to make choices about who to tax and who to spare. And instead of uh, carrying on down the path that this Chancellor is going on, he should look again at Labour's proposals for a windfall tax and use that to keep bills low for everybody else. That would be my priority as a Chancellor. I'm deeply disappointed it doesn't seem to be this Chancellor's priority. Um, I just want to talk to you about a couple of things that the, that the Prime Minister said uh, yesterday uh, at the Conservative Spring Conference. 
Um, we played the clip of him speaking to Rishi Sunak uh, earlier, but just to read you uh, his words. He said, the people of this country, like the people of Ukraine, choose freedom every time. I can give you a couple of famous recent examples. When the British people voted for Brexit in such large, large numbers, I don't believe it was because they were remotely hostile to foreigners. It's because they wanted to be free to do things differently and for this country to be able to run itself. Now, Rishi Sunak uh, defended the Prime Minister. He said that he wasn't trying to make a, a comparison. It's not directly analogous, he said, and the Prime Minister wouldn't say that either. What's your take on what the Prime Minister said? It is utterly distasteful and insulting to compare the fight for freedom and the aggression of the Russian uh, state to the decision to leave the European Union. It is insulting to the Ukrainian people who are fighting for their very freedom and their very lives, and it's insulting to the British people as well. And if the Prime Minister didn't mean that analogy, he shouldn't have made it. And he should take those, back those words and apologise to the Ukrainian people and the British people for those crass remarks he made yesterday. Uh, Rishi Sunak uh, also uh, made the point that the UK has been really supporting Ukraine uh, and that President Zelensky uh, has been uh, very grateful uh, for the support that the Prime Minister has given him. Um, in the same speech, Boris Johnson said this about Labour. Do we want them in charge at this moment? Do we want them running up the white flag? Do you see them standing up to Putin's blackmail? What do you make of that? Well, I'm not going to take any lessons from this Prime Minister about standing up to the Russians. This was a Prime Minister who, on the eve of the invasion of Ukraine, was whining and dining uh, people with close links to Putin's regime. This is a Prime Minister who overruled the security service in giving a peerage to now Lord Lebedev of Siberia. So I'll take no lectures from this Prime Minister. He lacks the seriousness and gravity uh, for the moment, and I would answer the Prime Minister to apologise for his words that are deeply insulting to the people of Ukraine and absolutely ridiculous about the Labour Party. Uh, Rachel Reeves, thank you uh, very much indeed for being on the programme this morning. That was uh, Rachel Reeves ahead of next week's Spring Statement. Well, let's focus now uh, on the situation uh, in Ukraine. We've, of course, been discussing it uh, this morning. And there are reports that Russian forces had bombed an art school in Mariupol where 400 people were sheltering. According to the mayor of Mariupol, thousands of residents of the battered city have been forcibly taken to Russia. It does feel as if the news coming out of that country is just relentless at the minute. And we can speak now to one of those important voices from Ukraine. Uh, we're joined by the Deputy Prime Minister, Ola Stefanishina. Thank you so much for being on the programme. We always thank guests for coming on the show, but we are especially grateful to you. We, of course, can't say uh, where you are in Ukraine for obvious security reasons. Um, but what can you tell us and our viewers about the reality of what's happening on the ground? Yeah, indeed, I'm here in Ukraine on a beautiful Ukrainian land. Unfortunately, many cities and parts of Ukraine are under fire and nothing left from the beauty we all just seen 25 days ago. The situation is growing more and more severe, as I've been telling for a numerous time, more than 15 days of this resistance are the resistance of Ukrainian people, Ukrainian nation who face severe attacks. Basically, Russia has committed nearly all possible war crime uh, which the humanity has seen over the Second World War. The number of civilian victims is far more than of those from the armed forces of Ukraine. It is absolutely essential that nobody is getting used to the war. We stand, we resist, and we will go stronger regardless any attempts of the Russian Federation, which has failed so far in its majority. You say that the Russia, Russians have failed so far, but how much longer do you think Ukraine can withstand this? Well, uh, when we we're saying about the enormous bravery of Ukrainian people, Ukrainian nation, Ukrainian army and Ukrainian government, uh, it's something that we would expect from the all leaders around the world who are standing for the values enshrined in the UN Charter, and uh, that's why Ukraine will resist as long as it's needed to make sure that no terror 
no massive murdering, no genocide is committed on this land in the 21st century. But it is absolutely clear that only Ukrainian army and only Ukrainian president will not be able to withstand it alone. It's really important that all political leaders around the world, from U.S. to European Union and Asia, would stay united and establish the anti-war coalition. And only these joint efforts will allow us to prevent this massive genocide and murdering in the 21st century. So far, Ukrainian president, Ukrainian army, leaves a space and a time for the world leaders to get even more united and to stop this aggression. We will stand as much as it needed. So you believe it is a genocide? I absolutely believe it. And I am a lawyer myself and I commit myself to implementation of the decision. And recently, International Court of Justice um, uh, International Court of Justice has issued a very concrete ruling uh, on the case of genocide of Russian Federation against Ukrainian population. And it has obliged Russian Federation to suspend military operation and refrain from any military activity on our land. Uh, we know that the words and the rulings and the orders mean nothing to the Russian Federation. But it's not something I presume or anybody else presumes. This is the reality. Putin and Kremlin are the war criminals. They commit the war crimes and they do the targeted attempts to attack Ukrainian population. And you see it by the wording on the net denatification he's using. So uh, it's not a question. It's, it's simply the reality we all face in the 21st century. Another reality, um, a group of Ukrainian MPs came to the British Parliament this week and they were speaking about what's happened to women and girls in Ukraine, um, saying that they were being raped and then executed by Russian soldiers. I mean, it's, it almost feels too terrible to talk about, but it feels very important to talk about. What are you hearing about what is happening to women and girls in Ukraine? You know, in Ukrainian government, I used to, before the war, uh, run the file related to gender equality and women empowerment. And of course, the first five days of war, the horrible stories of women I've heard about those women who has been raped for, for hours and then murdered, about the men and children who have been killed, the hospital druid. Uh, my tears were stopless, but now I have the very strong aggression to make sure that each and every military criminal who has committed this crime is held to account. That's why uh, we have more than 2,000 cases, uh, criminal cases, opened in our prosecutor's office. We have the permanent information of the International Red Cross Organization and each and every soldier who has committed this war crime by order or not will be held accountable. Be sure, Russian soldiers, that we fix and see it all and Ukrainian women will stand for each other and we will prevail. It's incredibly inspiring to hear you talk like this. It really is. Um, President Zelensky has told Putin uh, that now is the time to talk. How hopeful are you that there could be some kind of agreement, some kind of diplomatic solution? Well, it's not, uh, it, it, it is definitely not the talking between uh, a brotherhood nation or a bigger or smaller brother. Uh, Ukraine is feeling absolutely open to any kind of talk because we stand on our values. We are backed up by each and every nation of Ukraine, each and every citizen of Ukraine, and we're united as never before. So uh, these talks may take place. Hopefully they will lead us to some result. We're extremely happy that many of the uh, European nations like Turkey, like Israel, and, uh, and transatlantic nations like Israel and other countries has um, uh, initiated uh, and will and show the willingness to facilitate this dialogue. Of course, we utilize all of these opportunities and jointly I'm sure that Ukraine uh, will reach the agreement uh, on the peaceful settlement, but also will be um, uh, uh, the uh, country who will have the guarantees of its security. Solid, clear, and very well uh, understood to everybody, guarantees of its security, not only from Russian Federation, but from other countries who has the word to say in, uh, in that situation. What could an agreement look like? It feels as if there could be some movement on NATO, would Ukraine be prepared to give up some territory to Russia? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, Ukrainian territory is a territory which has been fixed in, in 1991. 
within its entirety and uh, internationally recognized border. It's not only the position of Ukraine, it's the position of the whole world enshrined in the numerous decisions of the UN Security Council, including Security Council, where the Russia is was standing. So it's not an option for discussion. Of course, there might be a room for discussion on the reintegration of those territories who has been under occupation for the last eight years. Uh, while uh, there are like a number of the red lines, which are uh, the inexcusability to legitimize anyhow the unlawful and provoked military aggression on our territory. This is the red line for us. And uh, speaking of NATO, uh, as I'm leading the NATO file in the Ukrainian government, I can say that the, the, the feeling and the, uh, the political priority is still there, while the ultimate element of the agenda today is the, uh, is the ceasefire and the security guarantee. So far, NATO has not suggested anything uh, in the first and the second uh, element of these needs from our side. So uh, that's why we're looking for those options which will ensure our security and withdrawal of Russian forces from our territory. Thank you. That's very clear. And um, just finally, we've been hearing some horrific reports coming out of Mariupol. Um, shelters being bombed. The mayor says that citizens are being forcibly removed and taken to Russia. What can you tell us about what is happening in Mariupol? Uh, Mariupol is basically the, the forepost of all the tragedy and sufferings our people are facing right now. It's already for the 10th day when the Ukrainian government, with the support of the ICRC, the Red Cross organization, and UN are trying to facilitate this process, while Russians have tried to legitimize the evacuation of Ukrainian people to Russia and Belarus through international organization where they were blocked and it has been um, recognized as absolutely a nonsense to evacuate people to the territory of the country who has started the aggression on Ukrainian territory. So now they do it forcefully, uh, reaching the, the level of people suffering to the, to the way that they are ready to get evacuated everywhere just to stay more or less out of this bombing and the spread of their life is less. Of course, we call on standing on the official information, official uh, sources of information from the UN, ICRC, Ukrainian government, who provide the data on the agreed route for evacuation for Ukrainian citizens, who provide the humanitarian assistance. Please, Ukrainian people, the people of Europe, stand with us, stand for the rule of law, and do not be subjected to manipulations from Russian Federation. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, before we leave, I just want to give you the opportunity, if there's anything else that you would like to say to Western leaders, um, you're, you're the voice of Ukraine for us this morning, so what would your message be? My message would be that uh, be as brave as Ukrainians, and uh, utilize each and every minute of your time while we're keeping the, the peace on your land to make sure that the aggressor and the terrorist is stopped. We deserve it as a nation, we deserve it as a people, and we all deserve it as a Europe. Thank you so much for being on the programme this morning. You're an incredibly powerful voice for your country, so it's been very important to listen to. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as we just heard, uh, it's more important than ever to try and get as clear a picture as we can of exactly what is happening uh, in Ukraine uh, at the moment, and especially, of course, in those strategically important areas of the south. We were just talking about the besieged city of Mariupol. Uh, Odessa uh, is another one of these really critical areas uh, at the minute uh, in Ukraine. We can talk now to our correspondent, Nick Martin, who is in Odessa for us. Nick, thank you very much for speaking to us. What is the situation like where you are? Odessa, uh, Sophie, is, uh, as you've just said, is a, is a key port city and it is being very heavily defended and fortified now. Um, for the last few days, we've been aware of reports of a Russian military naval buildup of warships on the Black Sea coast just off Odessa. And it's a sign for the residents of this city that the threat lurks out on the horizon. But thankfully, uh, this city has not seen uh, any, anything in much way of, of attack, certainly nothing on the scale of Mariupol and Mykolaiv just to the, to the east of here. But having said that, 
it is widely regarded to be something of an inevitability that the conflict will come to Odessa. It is strategically just such a key port. For the people who are trying to flee this war, it is a long journey for a lot of people. We're at a Red Cross bus station here in Odessa this morning. These people from the Odessa region have come with their belongings packed up into suitcases and they're now waiting for buses to take them away across the Moldovan border to the west here. Now, some of these people are from Odessa, some of them are from the wider region, but all of them share one thing in common, and that is they are just not confident about staying here anymore. It is just too dangerous. And everywhere you see sort of acts of kindness, this is the local church putting some food out, water, some crackers and some coffee. And this is what keeps these people going because this is a very horrendous time for people. The UN have issued some astonishing figures about the amount of people who are now internally displaced in Ukraine. Four and a, six and a half million people are now away from their homes, cast out into this country. And a lot of them are already trying to figure out where they're going to live for the next few months and possibly even years. For people who live in Mariupol, that is a city, and I've been seeing pictures coming through for the last few days, that's a city that has just been pounded and pounded until there is nothing left. The images are just so desperately sad. And today we've had reports that 400 people who were hiding in a shelter in a local art school are now under the rubble because a bomb struck that place last night. That comes after a barracks was struck yesterday while soldiers slept and a few days before that a theatre which was being used as a shelter was struck and so it, it's just a desperate desperate situation and places like Odessa are kind of holding their breath now trying to figure out when the attack will come and how bad it will be one thing to say though Odessa is is a very well defended city the other night we heard that a Russian missile had been fired in towards where we were and that a defence missile had been sent back and exploded it. That perhaps will give some people some heart here about, you know, well, whether they can be defended or not. And they are looking at their leaders politically. Uh, they're looking at their leaders like President Zelensky, who from the very start has tried to communicate with his population via social media and that leadership has filtered down to the regional governments here. Look at the Klitschko brothers in Kyiv, Vitaly Kim uh, in Mykolaiv on, on social media every day trying to sort of rally their own people. These political leaders, regional political leaders, have become heroes in trying to give the people here who are scared some information about what might happen, where they can go for help. And so the political system here has rallied to try and give support to these kind of people here who have nowhere else to go, but what they do know is they are fleeing war and they can't get away from it quick enough. These people will cross the border in Moldova later today. That is a small country that is absolutely full. If they get to Poland, that's full. Warsaw, all the capitals, Krakow, they're full. And so it is a refugee crisis like we haven't seen since the Second World War. And sooner or later, Europe will have to try and come up with a long-term plan in which to try and cope with this huge migration. Sophie. Thank you, Nick. I have to say, just looking at the faces of those people behind you, as you say, holding their breath, waiting to see if what is happening in Mariupol is going to happen in Odessa, packing their bags and waiting. It's an incredible incredibly powerful image for us this morning. So thank you very much for bringing us uh, that update, Nick Markin. Thank you. We'll have more uh, on the situation uh, in Ukraine in just a few minutes uh, as well, uh, talking about the military uh, side of things. Uh, but I do have uh, something else to talk to you about this morning uh, as well, because we're launching a new programme uh, later in the spring that I want to tell you about. It's called The Take with Sophie Ridge, and it's going to be live every Wednesday evening at 9pm. So this is in addition to uh, the Sunday show, and it's a chance for us to take the political temperature midweek, react to Prime Minister's questions early in the day. Uh, but the thing that I'm most excited about as well uh, is not just speaking to government ministers and the opposition parties and backbenchers, but we're going to be talking to you as well. Uh, this is the big idea. Uh, we want to get your reaction because we're searching for a regular panel of Sky News viewers to take part in the programme and to give us your opinions on some of the big political issues of the week. So if you want to be considered, then do please email the take with Sophie Ridge at sky.uk. It's on your screen now, the take with Sophie Ridge 
at sky.uk. Just include a couple of lines about yourself, what your politics are, any particular interest you have. Uh, there's more information online at news.sky.com. If you're a bit nervous, don't worry, we'll guide you through the whole process. It will be fine. Uh, also, our weekly podcast is Back. If you scan the QR code on your screen right now, you can find the Sofa Ridge on Sunday podcast and then that will subscribe you so it will be in your feed each week. So there's going to be highlights of the interviews, a bit of post-match analysis and also an insight into how we put the programme together. So you can find that and subscribe wherever you get your uh, podcast. You can just search for Sofa Ridge on Sunday and it should be available later today. Of course, uh, to uh, the destruction uh, wrought on Ukrainian towns and cities by those relentless uh, attacks from Russia. The shelling and airstrikes on those civilian areas has been a tactic previously used by Moscow and Chechnya and Syria to try and break the will of local populations. The Ukrainian government has also accused the Russians of blocking aid supplies, trying to get into besieged cities and refusing uh, humanitarian corridors. Well, we're joined now by Air Marshal Philip Osborne. He's a former Chief of Defence Intelligence and a Director at Universal Defence and Security Solutions. Thank you so much for being uh, with us. We're three weeks now into this invasion. What is the current state of Putin's troops? I think it's fair to say... Um... They're pretty demoralised, pretty stuck, and they're pretty stalled, actually. Um, they're demoralised because they were poorly prepared uh, and they've been proven to be um, inadequate. I think that's putting it mildly. Um, they're stalled because they've lost momentum. So we're seeing them pull resources, manpower from across Russia, even from Syria. Uh, that's, that's not a good indication for a you know, supposed superpower. And they're stalled because they're running out of options. Um, and really what's left to them now is to, is to double down on brute force, um, to put pressure on the Ukrainian government. You see, this is the worry, I guess, isn't it? Um, that even if the Ukrainian resistance has been more than anyone could have anticipated, even if the Russian forces are demoralised, do you think it is brute force that we're going to see more of? Um, I think it is. Um, Russia's tried to be agile, and that's failed. It wasn't up to it. Um, so now it's faced with how does it how does it get the Ukrainian government to settle on terms which are far more favourable uh, to to Russia to Putin. I mean, this is all about Putin, um, and therefore the way they apply apply pressure to the Ukrainian government is to you know level cities, um, to bring in huge artillery. Um, to try and generate that humanity, humanity and pressure, just not on the government, but also on the West. So, are you worried that Putin could start using weapons that we don't usually see uh, in, in these kind of fields of conflict? Um, chemical weapons, for example, even the so-called, like, you know, test of a nuclear? Well, how far could it go? I think... I think we'll see more conventional firepower first. Mm -hmm. um, Russia has huge artillery stocks. Um, and this is now a long, drawn-out conflict. And they uh, can be devastating as well, right? Exactly right. Um, so, so we will see lots of conventional, but the risk of more unconventional, whether it be chemical, whether it be bio, whether it be even nuclear, that risk must be higher. Um, we come back to Putin does ha doesn't have many military options, and they're his, therefore his options to escalate are narrower. And, of course, this has an impact on how the West responds. It does. Um, the, West, the West has got a challenge. Um, it has got to strike the balance between trying to deter behaviour without excessively escalating. So this is a really difficult tightrope to walk. Um, but, but we have to be strong, we have to be resolute. Putin does not respect weakness. He sees us as weak, he sees us as de decadent. He knows that every time he pushes us, we take a step back. So he will have been surprised by um, the overwhelmingly strong sanctions that have been levelled against him. He'll be surprised by the willingness of the West to support the Ukrainian government and their armed forces. But it's not enough. Um, so there's something about the West needing to reset what it means about strength and resolution in order to deter further aggression. So what does that mean in practical terms? What do you think we should do? So there's a thing for the UK and there's a thing for, for the West more broadly. Um, the West needs to be 
It needs to be less trivial. It needs to be more strategic. It needs to be more resolute in the way that we've seen over the last few weeks, but we weren't seeing over the previous 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I think the integrated review from a UK perspective is a good start. Um, but what this demonstrates is that security isn't about sound bites, it's about doing difficult things and being focused on maintaining those difficult things. So, so the integrated review, yes, is a good start. We need more mass and capability. That's probably more in the unmanned space, probably. Um, we certainly need more um, digital capabilities and we, and we need really as a nation to be more resilient. Um, that's both physically, can we defend ourselves uh, in the virtual space? Can we, are we good at cyber resilience? But also in, in the way we are, you know, the strength of our society, what, what do we feel? The most important thing though is, is we've got to go quickly. This, this is a wake up call. And if you look at the integrated review, it has a 10 year horizon. That is too long. Do we need more money? I, it was interesting when I spoke to the Chancellor earlier, he was just talking about the money that he'd already given uh, to the Ministry of Defence. And I got the very clear Im impression that we shouldn't expect any more. Um, and <clears throat> the, the Chancellor will make the decisions that he needs mm -hmm. to make. If you ask somebody who did uh, nearly 40 years uh, in the UK military, um, sinusoidal application of investment is no good for it. Mm -hmm. So it needs sustained investment to allow us to protect the nation, but also from a UK military point of view to take its part in a far more strengthened NATO. Um, for Germany to commit 100 billion euros in one year, I think indicates the scale of the challenge that all Western nations follow. And the UK, I'm sure, would want to play its part. Um, I just want to uh, draw us back to the situation that we're seeing unfolding in Ukraine. The bombardment has been pretty relentless and it seems that we should expect more <laughs> of the same. How long, realistically, do you think the Ukrainians can withstand this? Um, they have been amazing. Um, but we need to bear in mind that they, they've been preparing for this. This, for most of the West, started three weeks ago. For Ukraine, this started nearly a decade ago. That's a good point. Um, so they've had time to prepare, to think. It's that resilience that I was talking about. Um, they've also got a strength of will and the application of good weaponry, which I think we're seeing. Um, frankly, I think they will hold out as long as we can supply them and as long as their morale holds up. And those are two very easy things to say, uh, but really challenging to do. But focusing on supporting a brave people, do what's right for them, has to be one of those things that the West does to show strength and resolution. And um, President Zelensky has said that it's time to talk. He's called on Russia to get around the table and to try and find a diplomatic solution. Um, in the UK, our Foreign Secretary Liz Truss has effectively said she doesn't trust Russia. She thinks it could be a smokescreen to allow Russia to regroup and then carry out more attacks. What is your sense about how optimistic you are that any of these talks could actually lead to some kind of solution? Um, I'm quite pessimistic in the short term. Mm -hmm. Two things have to line up. Uh, Ukraine has to be comfortable to give something up. Which, to be honest, with our interview with the Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister, she said that that was absolutely off the table. And you can understand why that's the case, because mm. thousands of Ukrainians are laying down their lives as we speak for that, for that sense of self. Mm. So the, what is Ukraine prepared to give up and what is Putin prepared to accept from the perspective of a paranoid individual? Until those two things get close, then there won't be an agreement. And I can't see those things getting close soon. Mm. Um, I understand the pessimism um, that you have. Just finally, Ukraine is also asking for other countries to effectively act as security guarantors for any peace deal. So effectively, if they end up agreeing to not join NATO and they sign some kind of deal, they want the assurance that they will be backed up if Russia tries to invade again in the future or so on. Do you think the UK should be prepared to give that assurance to Ukraine? And what, what would that mean? Uh, the Ukraine has a security guarantee already. It was given in 1994 mm -hmm. by the US, the UK and Russia. Mm -hmm. And where are we now? Mm -hmm. 
So if I was a Ukrainian, I'd want to be really clear that those security guarantees were cast iron, yeah. and more cast iron than they were 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, those type of things, I'm sure, will have to be part of a solution. But if I was a Ukrainian, I'd want to see the colour of people's money. And that brings you back to resolution and meaning what you say, mm -hmm. not going through the motions. Mm -hmm. Really interesting to talk. And thank you so much for being on the programme uh, today. Thank you. Well, that is it uh, for this week. Sophie Ridge uh, on Sunday. What a busy show. Uh, in a moment after the break, we'll be running through today's interviews and talking about what we learned. We're going to be joined by our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates. Thank you for joining us this Sunday morning. We'll see you next week.
Hello and welcome to Sophie Ridge on Sunday, The Take, where we'll be having a pause to reflect and give some thoughts on what we've just been hearing over the last uh, hour. Really busy show today. Of course, the latest uh, on that um, horrific situation uh, in Ukraine. It feels like with every morning uh, that you wake up, there's more uh, terrible news to come out of that country. But today on the show, we were also focusing uh, on what is happening here in the United Kingdom, because Clearly, uh, the sanctions that we've made against Russia are going to start biting here in the UK very soon. And that is on top uh, of rising inflation and a cost of living crisis that was already uh, on the way. So things are going to be getting very difficult for people. Uh, next week, Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, is going to be sending out his uh, spring statement. He was on the programme today, uh, along with his uh, opposition uh, partner, Rachel Lees Reeves for Labour. So I was really trying to get a bit of a sense on what we can expect next week. It's always hard with these interviews because there's only so much they can say, of course, uh, before these big uh, moment uh, announcements. But I thought we did get a bit of a sense uh, from the Chancellor uh, on a few of his priorities uh, and also, of course, uh, about the how levelling with people effectively on just how difficult things could be. On the show, as always, we're joined by our Deputy Political Editor, um, Sam Coates, who I think I can bring in now. Sam, hello to you. Good to see you. Um, Pretty, I can see you're smiling away, as you always do on a Sunday morning, but it was a pretty pessimistic message from Rishi Sunak, wasn't it? It was. I mean, it's remarkable, really, that Rishi Sunak, ever since he was appointed, surprisingly, in January 2020, has effectively been a crisis chancellor. Um, Rishi Sunak, I think, would cast himself as somebody who was fiscally quite conservative. In other words, he likes uh, to cut where possible, uh, be that public spending or be that taxes. Um, and as you demonstrated very clearly by showing him uh, the graph of what he's been up to over the last few years, he hasn't been able to do that. Uh, there have been, uh, there's been the pandemic, now there's the war in Ukraine. Um, and whether it's Rishi Sunak or his opposite number, uh, Rachel Rees, for Labour, uh, you do have to give them uh, some breathing space because the decisions that they are facing, the de decisions that the country is facing as a result, first of the pandemic, now of the war in Ukraine, are very, very difficult uh, indeed. But they are very important. And as you say, on Wednesday, uh, we get the spring statement. Now, two weeks ago, my sense from the Treasury was that this was little more than an update. They wanted to uh, maybe sort of uh, put the tilt the tiller a little bit, um, steady as she goes. Uh, they weren't planning any great big announcements. But I think what's become clear, what's become horribly clear over the last two weeks, is that the pressures on people are just enormous. On Friday at the start of Blackpool Spring Conference, um, I left the conference to go to a soup kitchen. Uh, there, the person who uh, runs it told me that he set that up in order to help the homeless. Now he was helping families and people in work. And the situation just in the last month had got so much worse because of inflation, because of energy, energy bills, because of food prices. This is the challenge uh, that the Chancellor uh, has to tackle. And as you say, Sophie, I think you did um, a great job getting uh, some of the hints, some of the contours of what we're going to see uh, on Wednesday uh, in that uh, in that interview. But um, he doesn't have endless amounts of money to play with. Uh, so the question is, does he live up to his promise to stand by the British people, the promise that he made on, on your show just now? Yeah, I was quite surprised, in a way, how firm he was when he made that promise to stand by the British people. Um, he, of course, many people remember, was the person who'd stepped in to directly pay people's wages during the pandemic. I mean, I don't think we're expecting to see anything on that scale uh, of intervention, but I thought he did lay some groundwork to do something. Um, we'll come back to you in just one moment, but let's hear a little bit from uh, Rishi Sunak, um, shall we? Um, he was trying to level with people, I felt, uh, and trying to say, tell people that, yes, these sanctions on Russia are going to have an impact here in the UK. Let's have a listen. I want people to know, and they should be reassured, that, look, I, I will stand by them in the same way that I have done over the last couple of years to try and make a difference where I can. But as you said, the actions and the steps we're taking to sanction Russia are not cost-free for us here at home. I, I can't pretend that it's going to be easy, that government can solve every challenge, or that I can completely protect people against some of the, the difficult times ahead. But what I can say is where we can make a difference, of course we will. That's what we've done over the past two years. Well, we can make a difference, uh, we can. He's obviously going to do something. As you say, it was expected to be uh, no more than a bit of an update, like talking about the economic situation, a couple of tweaks here and there. But it, uh, my impression after that interview was we are going to see some kind of movement. 
That's right. And I think where the Treasury have sort of been gearing up to do something is perhaps help with the benefit system and maybe to take the edge off that thing that the government has chosen to do to the British people, which is the 1.25% national insurance increase on employers and employees, which is incredibly toxic, even within uh, the Conservative Party. Boris Johnson has done it in order to try and funnel more money into the NHS and then eventually uh, social care. Uh, but it's coming in in the next few weeks, just as all these higher prices are going to hit. Now, the Chancellor has a number of options when it comes to what his biggest kind of rabbit out of the hat is on Wednesday. He could cancel that altogether for a year. He does actually have the money. That's about uh, nine or ten billion quid. Uh, but I think he would worry that it would just make it harder to introduce the year after. And if he didn't do it, then then the NHS spending becomes impossible. He could just sort of uh, deaden the, be the, the, the impact of it for l the less well-off, uh, or he could do a big rise uh, in the benefit system for universal credit. Uh, those are the kinds of options. Um, if he is being moderately generous, he will be spending somewhere in the, in the region of nine or ten billion pounds, uh, which is only, as you pointed out, uh, 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 a sort of a quarter of the um, 40 billion that uh, he has to play with. But nevertheless, I'd expect sort of intervention on that scale on Wednesday. Otherwise, he's going to come under quite some fire from his own side uh, for uh, not giving sufficient help to people. Thanks, Sam. And one of the areas that he uh, is under pressure on uh, is fuel duty. We've seen other countries uh, making a move uh, on this. For example, uh, France, Ireland, they've moved to give help uh, on those rocketing fuel uh, costs. And it's always funny with these interviews because you're trying to get a bit of a sense, tease a few news lines out. And my feeling was that this is a man who is always very tight-lipped in these uh, pre-budget, pre-spending uh, statement interviews. The fact that he talked a little bit about fuel duty in his own constituency and he understood how hard things were, that made me feel there could be a bit of movement there. Let's have a listen to what the Shadow Chancellor and the Chancellor had to say on fuel duty. I have a rural constituency. People are incredibly reliant on their cars, and this is one of the biggest bills that people face. So we're watching it go up, right? And we're all seeing that. And when we're filling up our cars, I get that. That's why we've frozen fuel duty already. I announced that in autumn. It's the 11th con you know, consecutive year of fuel duty freezes, and that really helps people. I know that. If the Chancellor reduces fuel duty this week, we won't stand in his way, but e even a 5p reduction in fuel duty will only reduce filling up the car with petrol by £2. So I don't think that really rises to the scale of the challenge that we face at the moment, which is why we're calling for a windfall tax on the big profits being made by North Sea oil and gas companies right now. Uh, Labour there saying that they wouldn't stand in the way of any uh, movement on fuel duty. Um, there's been a little bit of pick-up, actually, for some of these um, comments on fuel duty as well. This is The Sun's uh, political correspondent, Natasha Clark. She tweeted Rishi Sunak giving a bit of ankle on a fuel duty cut in the next few days. Yeah, that's definitely the impression that I got as well. Um, so we'll have to wait and see just a few more days. But it does feel as if there could be some movement uh, there. Let's bring in uh, Sam Coates again, shall we? And Sam... Do you think that it's going to be enough to try and calm some of that bubbling anxiety we're starting to see uh, among the Conservative uh, backbenchers about the hit to their, con their constituents that is coming? No. I mean, if you even take just the fuel duty issue, um, one of the reasons that Rishi Sunak can is because he gets more tax money uh, whenever f uh, the price of fuel goes up. Uh, walking past petrol pumps yesterday, uh, diesel was up at 180, 185 as I was on my way back from Blackpool. That is an eye-watering amount that directly will translate into, for instance, people f people's fuel um, food costs because it's diesel that needs to go into the lorries that uh, brings people's food uh, to their nearby supermarkets. So there is uh, an impact all over the place. Um, and uh, a little bit here and a little bit there may well not uh, rise to the scale of the challenge that people are facing. And the big driver, the thing the Treasury knows, is that the big driver uh, of people's uh, bills going up is uh, our energy prices. And that's the hundreds of pounds that people are going to have to uh, shoulder on their energy bills coming in next month. Um, but the problem is that there is a widespread expectation that on top of the 
600 or so pounds a year extra that, they, that they're going to have to pay from April. The crisis in Ukraine is going to increase energy bills, perhaps by an additional a thousand pounds. We'll find out exactly how much uh, more the uh, regulators think needs to go. Uh, uh, the price cap needs to rise by in August and it'll be implemented in October. But the sums, frankly, in terms of household budgets are unimaginable. Um, people are losing a th somewhere in the region of a thousand pounds of their household income uh, in this coming financial year. That's the expectation. Uh, entire percentage points uh, of their, uh, of their uh, spending money disappearing as a result of things completely out of their control. And it, when it comes to those energy bills, it isn't the case that people can uh, simply, for instance, turn down the thermostat, turn off the heating, because a big part of everybody's bills that's going up are those standing charges, i.e. the fixed cost bit, uh, that you can't really do anything about. That, that goes to pay for the insurance scheme that kicks in when energy companies gone, go bust, an awful lot of those have, uh, and for some of those green charges. There's a huge political fight on many fronts. And so I don't think that the spring statement on Wednesday is the end of the matter by any means. Uh, and I think this is just going to be the topic of 2022. Uh, thank you, uh, Sam. Um, it, it does feel you can understand why uh, Rishi Sunak uh, perhaps felt... Uh, while Rishi Sunak perhaps felt uh, slightly aggrieved at the uh, tax spending uh, graph because he has not only had to have this cost of living crisis to deal with, but also, uh, of course, the COVID uh, situation too. His argument... For his defence, if you like, for why he's putting up taxes at a time when people are feeling this dramatic cost of living squeeze uh, that Sam Coates was just talking about, uh, is that they need to sort the long-term funding for the NHS and also uh, social care. Um, so what is Labour's position? Do they agree with the taxes that are due to come in in the coming days? This is what the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, has to say. But we now know that there's going to be no new money for social care in this parliament. Then they said it was to reduce NHS waiting times. Uh, but there's no credible plan to do that in this parliament. The problem with national insurance is that it's a tax on work. It's a tax charged by those people who go out to work every day and those people who employ them. Some of the richest people in our country who earn an income through uh, uh, dealing in stocks and shares or through a portfolio of buy-to-let properties they won't pay a penny more in tax with the national insurance rise. That's not right. It's not right that ordinary working people should be fitting the bill. Oh, well, let's bring in our deputy political editor, um, Sam Coates. I made the point to Rachel Reeves, some, look, slightly jokingly, really, um, that it's strange to hear Labour attacking the Conservatives for a tax rise to pay for the NHS. But it, it does feel as if we're in slightly uncharted territory here. And on this... I know plenty of Conservatives that would agree with Rachel Reeves. Look, up in Blackpool Spring Conference, I challenged Jacob Rees-Mogg to defend the national insurance rise. He declined to do so and say it was a matter for the Chancellor. I've been talking to big donors who worry that the money going in to help the NHS isn't going to deliver the results people want in, that, in this Parliament. That's exactly what Rachel Reeves just said. So Labour making an argument but also punching a Conservative bruise. Sam, thank you uh, very much. We'll have more from Sam uh, after uh, the break because we'll also be looking uh, at what Rishi Sunak uh, had to say about the situation uh, in Ukraine and, of course, the Prime Minister's slightly controversial comments uh, to Spring Conference yesterday where he appeared to be comparing it to the vote to leave the EU. The wind was, like, pulling us out of that little room. I'm Greg Milam, Sky's US correspondent here in Los Angeles. It is almost impossible to predict where these fires will go next. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. This gives you an idea of the strength of those winds, strong enough to bend and twist metal. Are you trying to run me over, Sir Philip? No, go away. Look like it, sir. Will you respond to those who've made accusations, Sir Philip? Can you go away? I've seen the dark side of America. We are standing on the supply line right into the heart of America's opioid crisis.
I've seen heartbreaking human stories. There was a river of blood coming out of the mosque. That's a scene that you don't forget. Christchurch has been changed forever by what happened. I'm Becky Johnson, a Sky News Midlands correspondent based here in Birmingham. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. Hello, welcome back to Safety Ridge on Sunday, The Take, where we have a moment to take you back through the morning's interviews and we get a bit of analysis uh, with our deputy political editor, Sam Coates. Um, now, Sam, of course, was uh, at uh, the Conservative uh, Spring Conference uh, in Blackpool uh, yesterday. There was a couple of controversial things, weren't there, that the Prime Minister said on stage. Just explain to us what he said and, and how it went down in the hall. So, yes, we were up in Blackpool yesterday for the spring conference speech by the um, Prime Minister, and he went a bit further than some expected. Um, he devoted a lot of his speech to the conflict of in, in Ukraine. But as part of that speech, he was drawing analogies between the freedoms that people want in Ukraine and the freedoms that he has championed in Britain. And he singled out the vote for Brexit in that. Now, uh, that has subsequently drawn a lot of criticism from uh, not just, it has to say, I have to say, political opponents, but also people inside the Conservative Party. One cabinet minister messaged me this morning, said that they thought it was inappropriate. Theresa May's former chief of staff, Gavin Barwell, uh, has also criticised it. Tobias Elwood has gone on record to criticise it. So this has caused something of a, uh, of a, uh, uh, of a storm because people think that that was in inappropriate. And then there was a second thing uh, that perhaps raised even more eyebrows, uh, he alleged that uh, had Labour been in power, then they would have uh, basically hoiked up the white flag to President P Putin, essentially have surrendered. That was his allegation. That, of course, infuriates Labour. They have done a very clear job of showing uh, and saying that they stand with the Prime Minister on the action, uh, NATO action, against President Putin. Uh, so many uh, angered by those comments too. Um, Boris Johnson, of course, has a habit of doing this kind of thing, uh, but not everybody in his own party likes it. But I have have to say, in the hall afterwards, talking to activists, they were delighted with the speech and this kind of stuff, water off a duck, duck, uh, duck's back to the people who are in the hall listening to it. Actually, quite an important point to make, uh, how, how it did go down uh, with the activists there. Well, I did ask uh, Rishi Sunak about his reaction to what the Prime Minister uh, had to say uh, about Ukraine and then the um, Brexit vote. Let's have a listen to what the Chancellor said. The situations are, are obviously not analogous, right? That one is a democratic referendum in a country where, thankfully, we're able to debate uh, ideas in, in peace and, and, and freedom. Ukraine wants to join the EU. And, and, and of course, and that, and that should be their right. And actually, that's part of that's part of the situation that Putin finds uh, was well, for him. He doesn't like the idea at all, right? Uh, that idea of expression of freedom. But the, I think I said that they're not directly analogous situations. But I don't believe the prime minister was saying that they were either. It is utterly distasteful and insulting to compare the fight for freedom and the 
aggression of the Russian uh, state to the decision to leave the European Union. It is insulting to the Ukrainian people who are fighting for their very freedom and their very lives, and it's insulting to the British people as well. And if the Prime Minister didn't mean that analogy, he shouldn't have made it, and he should take those, back those words and apologise to the Ukrainian people and the British people for those crass remarks he made yesterday. I'm not going to take any lessons from this Prime Minister about standing up to the Russians. This was a Prime Minister who, on the eve of the invasion of Ukraine, was whining and dining uh, people with close links to Putin's regime. Uh, Rachel Reeves uh, there giving her reaction uh, and we can bring in some Twitter reaction as well. Now this is one of Boris Johnson's old adversaries. I think he'll be unsurprised to uh, see the lack of support from David Gork, the former Conservative uh, Minister campaigner for Remain. He said, imagine being a serious, decent Conservative MP and having to go out and defend the Prime Minister's Ukraine Brexit remarks. No wonder Rishi Sunak looks uncomfortable. That's the reaction of uh, David Gork. Uh, well, let's bring uh, Sam Coates uh, back in, uh, shall we? Sam, I just want to draw you to the very final question I asked Rishi Sunak, because it does feel to me like this demonstrates just how far the political landscape has changed in a matter of months, if not weeks. I asked him, will Boris Johnson lead the Conservatives into the next election? And he gave me a one-word answer, which was yes. Do you think that... Any talk of Boris Johnson effectively resigning as leader or potentially a challenge from someone like Rishi Sunak, has that all gone? Has it disappeared? Or is it bubbling away still? Rishi Sunak said yes to you, partly, I think, because he's right, the context has changed for Boris Johnson's uh, predicament for his future. He is safer than he was uh, a few weeks ago. He also said it because, frankly, if he'd said anything else, he probably wouldn't be in the job of Chancellor for much longer. Um, but Rishi Sunak himself is in an interesting position. He dealt with the questions about what Boris Johnson said yesterday by basically asserting that Boris Johnson didn't really say it or didn't really mean it. And, and, and you could see, I think, the discussion comfort on Rishi Sunak's face. This is not his kind of politics. This is not uh, the kind of way he likes to fight political battles. There were reports a few days ago that Rishi Sunak even considered resigning at the heart of Partygate. Uh, aides denied that that was the case. But I know he was deeply unhappy at the way the government was being run, the perception of the lack of seriousness. Now, that was partly about Partygate, uh, pandemic rule breaking uh, all the way through 2020, 2021, the, about which we still have uh, more to hear with the police inquiry and the Sue Gray report, the official report into what went on. But the question for MPs really was always, can Boris Johnson be trusted? Uh, does he follow the rules? And if he's caught out, is he straight with people or does he end up, as some suspect, lying to Parliament? Now, the war in Ukraine has completely changed the political conversation and the context. And you couldn't have come away from Blackpool Spring Conference thinking uh, anything other than the, the people who were sort of judge, jury and, and executioner of a Conservative Prime Minister, those Tory MPs and the activists that support them in their constituencies, are a lot happier uh, than they are. But the bigger picture questions will always remain. Having had that damage done to him, having had those questions raised about him, is Boris Johnson plain sailing all the way to, through to 2023, 2024 election? Or do some of the things that led us to that point keep coming back? That's the, that's the essay question, really, Sophie. I guess the other thing to throw into it uh, is the fact that we are about to see a cost of living crisis that we haven't seen for generations, people getting poorer, and it's difficult to see a situation where the governing party doesn't, at least to some extent, pick up some blame for that. Um, that's right. And when people get poorer, they justifiably look at the government, potentially get um, uh, more angry. And uh, I think people in the good times might take one view of their politicians, but they perhaps come to altogether uh, more uh, le less benevolent uh, conclusions when they are hurting, potentially hurting a great deal in the next few weeks and months. Sam, thank you very much for your analysis. Uh, as always, uh, much appreciated. Deputy uh, Political Editor Sam Coates uh, there. Well, that is it uh, from Sophie Bridge on Sunday. Uh, this morning, a really busy show. And of course, we've got a busy week coming up politically as well. With that statement from Rishi Sunak, how much support will there be uh, from people in the United Kingdom, in the United Kingdom, who are undoubtedly going to be experiencing economic pain in the months to come? See you next week, 8.30am, Sky News.